afternoon and welcome to the Reference Library. This afternoon, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this informative session on planning and retirement on a low income. John Stapleton is responsible for this work and he is joined by Ellen Roseman. This is very key information for low income seniors and there are not many offering this advice. We're very fortunate to have John and Ellen here this afternoon. There will be a lot of information to absorb and I want to remind you that the documents are available for purchase here after the lecture uh, and also they are available online at openpolicy.com. Also, Toronto Public Library is videotaping this session. And at a later date, it will be available on our YouTube channel. Okay? Before we get started, please hold your questions until the end of the session. When the Q&A is opened up, and that we'll have about a half hour of Q&A at the end of the talk, um, I'm going to request that you come to the center aisle uh, and come to the mic, and that's so that uh, everyone can hear the questions and that it will be picked up on the videotape. Okay, now Ellen Roseman is a journalist who sticks up for ordinary Canadians. She writes about personal finance and consumer issues for the Toronto Star and is the author of a number of books on these subjects the most recent being Fight Back, 81 Ways to Help You Save Money and Protect Yourself from Corporate Trickery. She's a very busy woman and has been a great supporter of the libraries in general and the library's financial programs in particular. She's going to introduce you to John, so I'm going to stop here and ask you both to welcome Ellen and John, and we will get started. Thank you, Laura. There's this deluge of information during February. You gotta buy your RSP. It's you know the patriotic thing to do. You're not a Canadian if you don't do it, and look what happens if you don't put money in your RSP, you're gonna be destitute when you get old. Now, as a journalist, that starts to bother me. Why does everybody say this? Why does everybody believe it? Why isn't there any other information? What about people who may not be that well off putting money into an RSP? Is it good for everyone? So I started looking around, and luckily I ran into a, an economist based in Ottawa called Richard Shillington, who John and I both uh, learned a lot from, who decided to get out there on the street and talk to real people. So he came to Toronto, he spent a year at St. Christopher's House, which deals with a lot of low-income people in the west end of Toronto, and just talked to them about how they saved their money, how they spent their money, what kind of government benefits they got. And he found some interesting stuff that didn't show up, that wasn't really on anyone's radar screen. He found that many of them were eligible for the GIS, the Guaranteed Income Supplement, because they were over 65, and they had income, so that they should be getting it. But they weren't getting it because they weren't filing a tax return, and they didn't really know that they were eligible. And then he started making a fuss, and he found out that the CRA said they didn't have a list, and um, they didn't have anyone to contact, and it turned out that the human resources and the CRA felt that there was a privacy issue, so they couldn't really pinpoint people who could be getting these benefits but were not. So he raised enough of a fuss through us in the media that that changed. So now at least the seniors who are supposed to be getting the GIS are at least notified that they should and that they should file a tax return to get it. But another thing he found out, and this I think was a major accomplishment, is that he realized that many people who had an RSP were being harmed by their RSP once they turned 65. How could your RSP harm you? Well, it seems that once you have that RSP savings built up, and you might build it up when you're you know, you're young and you think you're going to be well off, but you're not so well off after you retire. And at age 71, you've got to start liquidating your RSP and taking money out on a regular schedule that the government tells you to take out. So you have no flexibility at all. And the entire amount that you take out of the RSP that year goes into your taxable income. So what he found is that if you were at a low income level, those RSP withdrawals that you had to make every single year were raising your taxable income and making you less eligible for the GIS, for uh, 
uh, drug benefit programs for anything that was means tested. So they were actually harming people who were in their so-called golden years who had saved for retirement but hadn't saved enough to really make a big difference and now those RSP withdrawals were hurting them. So he suggested that we put together something that people could save for an RSP, save for retirement but was not an RSP. He called it, I think, a tax prepaid savings plan. And the government listened and brought in what is now known as a tax-free savings account. It's kind of like the mirror image of the RSP. The money is, is taxed already, so you put it into the plan, and it's not taxed when you take it out. So it doesn't hurt you at all when you retire. There's no income tax that you have to worry about, and all the money in there is yours. So that was an excellent um, innovation that was brought about by one academic spending some time on the ground and listening to how people actually manage their money. Another thing that the government came up with was the RESP, Registered Education Savings Plan. If you save for your grandchildren or your children for uh, post-secondary education, uh, the government would top up what you contributed by 20% a year. But then all of a sudden, like after this top up, a few years later, they realized many people save with an RESP, but they can't get to the level that's required. It was like 2,000 or 2,500 a year to get the top up. So why don't we offer something for them? So then the government got around to giving out the Canada Learning Bond, which is for people who are low income, according to their tax refund every year. And it gives them, I think, $1,000 when the baby's born, and it's much more geared to their income level. So what I'm trying to say is that the planning for people who are in a lower income levels is often an afterthought. It's not something that the government thinks about too much or doesn't always consider. And um, uh, another thing that we had in Ontario was that uh, Ontario changed its tax credit system so that instead of getting a monthly tax refund in uh, March or April, many people were finding that they were getting just monthly benefits instead of an annual tax refund, like a lump sum, they were getting monthly benefits. And they didn't like it, and they told the government that. And Dwight Duncan, who was then the finance minister, said, but we didn't know that because he hadn't consulted people. So this year, I think for the first time since they brought in that so-called trillion benefit, they are giving people the choice. So now they can opt for either a monthly uh, benefit, which I guess is making it easier for budgeting, or an annual lump sum. And for many of us, a tax refund is really the only kind of lump sum that we ever get. It's the only way we can win the lottery. There's a guy who's just written a book about RSPs, and he says, you shouldn't put um, uh, dry pasta into your RSP. Great metaphor. And he's talking about the fact that most people put the money into the RSP, they get a nice refund, and then they spend it. And he's saying, don't spend it. You should be putting that refund back into your RSP. And he has all the facts and the figures about how you, know, you really have to do that in order to capitalize on your RSP. But is that human nature, right? We like getting that tax refund, and we like using it. And uh, I'm, I said I'd write about it, but I'm not quite sure if that advice will, will resonate with people. So John Stapleton has spent his career as a civil servant in Ontario with the Ontario Community Social Services. And he knows very much about low-income people. And he retired a number of years ago and decided that he wanted to put those skills to use. So he started looking again at how people were spending their money and how the tax system worked and how the financial services system worked. And he realized, in much the way that I did, that a lot of it is not geared toward low-income people and penalizes them. For example, uh, a low-income mother who puts money into an RESP so her children can go to university, she's often seen as someone who has assets, and then those assets count against any kind of welfare benefits that she gets. So this is the kind of thing we always have to look to make sure that the tax system isn't hurting certain people, especially people with the lower incomes who are least able to afford it. And so John decided, rather than just talk about it, he wanted to put out brochures, and he has some available here. And he worked with a whole committee of financial experts and some journalists, including me, to try and make these brochures as simple as possible. He actually hired a plain language specialist to go through it and make sure that the wording was done properly, that it appealed to people at a grade six level, and that the presentation was done properly, large print, lots of white space, so they're easy to read and understand. So I will now turn it over to John to tell you about 
retirement planning for people with low incomes. So welcome, John. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for those kind words. So I'm going to talk a little bit on these slides, and I can make these slides available to you. So if someone uh, has an email and uh, wants these slides, I can make them available, and I'll also make them available on my website, which once again is openpolicyontario.com. All one word, openpolicyontario.com. So what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to try to do a little bit of what's called a TED Talk, uh, talk about uh, an opening um, sort of analysis for you, where I talk about po the, a parallel universe. And I'm going to talk also about something I call the E-word barrier, and we'll get into that in a second. Then we're going to talk about what our income system for retire retirees in Ontario actually is. And then I'm going to try to define for you what we mean by low income. And so when I'm talking about low income, I will be able to give you numbers so that if you know that you're going to have a retirement income that's below a certain amount, you should be listening very carefully. If it's just going to be above that amount, just a little bit, you should also listen carefully that if you have a higher income, say over 40000 a year, then the mainstream advice that Ellen talked about, the advice that you get in our RSP season, is going to be much closer to being the reality or what you should do. Then I'm going to talk about the top 10 rogues gallery of bad advice that you find from uh, the mainstream mainstream media and uh, mainstream financial companies. I'm then going to talk about briefly why is mainstream financial advice wrong and then what can be done about it. So let's start out. Back in September 2012, a fellow by the name of Preet Banerjee who writes for the uh, Globe and Mail, he was reviewing some of the work that I had done and he had a, an interesting phrase. He, taught, he said, there's sort of an alternate universe that exists for low-income seniors between 65 and 71, uh, quoting me. And I want to talk to you about a parallel universe. And do you, uh, have most of you, I'll just, you don't have to put up your hands, but just nod. The idea of a parallel universe is a place that's just like the planet that we live on, but in science fiction, it might be just a little bit different. It's uh, where things are sort of backwards from the way things are, and you, we saw it on The Twilight Zone and lots of different shows, science, science fiction shows, science fiction books would talk about these parallel universes that are just slightly different, but largely the same as our own universe. And in many ways, uh, low-income seniors live in a parallel universe where the advice that's given by the mainstream media and by financial institutions, in fact, is right for people who have income and who have higher incomes, but it's wrong for people who have low incomes. And often the advice that you get, if you're a low income person, it's the exact opposite. So if you're told to go out, as Ellen noted already, they're always telling you to go out and buy an RRSP, it's the last thing that you should do. Or if they tell you, to only get a TFSA, the tax-free savings account, after you have put money into your RRSP and have it all filled up, once again, if you're low income, you should do the exact opposite. You should start with your TFSA and maybe later on put something into an RRSP. They'll tell you to wait to apply for your Canada pension plan when actually if you're low income, you should be applying for your Canada Pension Plan retirement as soon as possible. They will tell you that you should not take your RRSP out, you should not cash it in before you're 65, but only cash it in after. Whereas for a low income person, they should be taking any RRSPs that they have 
leading up to their retirement at 65 and cashing them in, and then think about buying a, an RRSP after they turn 65. So it's this parallel universe that you're living in. If you're a low-income person, often the advice that you should take, you should take what the advice is, take the exact opposite of that advice, and that's often what you should be doing. So it's an interesting parallel universe that we live in. It doesn't mean that the advice the mainstream is giving is wrong. It just means it's not for you. But what they tend to do is treat lower income people as if they were rich people that don't have money. And lower, and lower income, yes, they are just like rich people that don't have money in one way, but in terms of the advice of what they should be doing with their finances is actually something very different. And now I want to talk a little bit about the E word. And the E word, E stands for entitlement. And in Canada, all of our income security system before 1970 was issued in the form of what we call entitlements or insurance programs. So for example, if we go back to 1970, we had a program called Old Age Security, which is an entitlement program. It's not a tax credit. We have programs like employment insurance and CPP, and um, the Guaranteed Income Supplement Program, which came along in the late 60s, around 1970. But during the 1970s, something very interesting happened. And that was that the federal government started to think more and more about the idea of, hey, we got this big tax system where we take in money I wonder, this is the federal civil servants and, uh, and then uh, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau at the time started to think maybe if we're sending these refund checks out to people through the, through the tax system, maybe we could use that same tax system to uh, provide income to people through various programs. And starting in 1978 with uh, then Minister Monique Bejan, they started to create what is now called refundable tax credits. Now before everybody glazes over and says, what's the difference between a non-refundable and a refundable tax credit? I want you to think about a normal tax credit that is not refundable, that doesn't use that word. That's like a coupon. So for example, if you get a coupon, I'm always seeing these coupons for Tide or for some wash, washing, uh, some sort of detergent of sorts. When you get a coupon, you can only use that coupon to reduce the cost of the item that you're buying. You can't go into a store with a dollar coupon and then go up to the cashier and say, I want a loony. Doesn't work that way. That coupon only works to take money off that item. But a, not, a refundable tax credit which pays out money to people who may not even be paying tax, you have to think of that as a gift card from the government of Canada. So one, when you get something called a non-refundable tax credit, that's something that allows you to pay less tax, like the charitable income receipts or some of your medical income receipts or um, the basic amount of income that you can have before you get taxed. That's all non-refundable and that's like getting one of those coupons. But then the government started with what I call the equivalent of a gift card with the uh, credits that it started providing to the, through the child benefit system in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And now we have all kinds of refundable tax credits that are paid out through the tax system. They are not entitlements. So we have child benefits. We have something called the Canada Child Tax Benefit. We have programs uh, like the GST credits. Ontario has a program called the Trillium Benefit Plan that Ellen already referred to. And we have a program called the Working Income Tax Benefit. All of those programs are like 
what we used to call entitlements because it's money paid out to you regardless of whether you pay tax. But since 1970, we have had no further entitlement programs. And one thing that you'll find in mainstream advice and often through the media and, through, and especially at the banks, anything that is going to make you eligible for an entitlement they won't want to get, they'll be squeamish about that. We don't want you um, arranging your affairs so that you would be able to get an entitlement. So you will find that the banks will not be knowledgeable about this very important program that we call the Guaranteed Income Supplement, which you get if you're low income and over 65. That is an entitlement program. It is not a tax credit. So. Whether it's an entitlement or a tax credit just depends on when they invented it. We didn't have any tax, refundable tax credits, no government gift cards up to the 70s, and then after that, everything that the government puts out has been in new programs, has been in the form of refundable tax credits. So the E word, the entitlement word, has a bit of a stigma to it. And so financial institutions won't try to arrange your affairs so you'll get an entitlement, but if it's a tax credit, they'll be all over it. They'll be helping you to get that. And so this is one of the issues that we face that the GIS, the income supplement, is an entitlement. So what is our income security system for retirees in Ontario? Well, in Ontario and in Canada, it's the old age security. That's your basic, what you call your old age pension. Right now, it's $551 a month for somebody who's lived in Canada at least 40 of the 47 years between their 18th and 65th birthday. And then people who are coming to Canada um, and they don't have 40 years residence in Canada, they will be getting less old age security. But for people who have lived here all their life, basically they're going to get the full amount of $551 a month. It's indexed quarterly. It keeps going up, and that's why the booklets that I'm that I'm peddling today um, uh, have. To, I don't update them all the time. What I do is simply put an update sheet that updates all the numbers. So everybody should have got a hold of that update sheet. I think I have enough copies for you. Now there's also a monthly allowance for people who are between 60 and 64, as long as they are single as long as they have been married and remain married uh, or if they have been widowed, um, but this allowance does not um, pay out to people who have been divorced or who have just been single. The Canada Pension Plan is another one of the big pillars of our retirement system and we, it is a payroll tax so anybody who makes money, you'll know that you have three big deductions that come off every paycheck. You have your income tax that comes off. You have your EI deduction, and you have your CPP deduction. And that CPP deduction, if you paid into CPP during your working life, you can get a monthly pension as early as age 60. And then finally, we have private pensions, work. We have more seniors who are working now and savings. And so this is their, our overall system. Now, when you ask for the purposes of this seminar, what do I mean by low income? If you are a single person, and I have put here as of April 2013, but this figure goes up to um, March 31st, 2014, if you are receiving less income from outside sources than $16,728 a year, then you are at the right seminar. So this does not count your old age security of about $550 a month. Uh, so that would be $6,000 and something per year. Uh, it doesn't count that, but if you have income from a pension, RRSPs, other sources of income, money, interest income, dividend income of every, any sort that's below 
$16,728 for a single person, then this advice and this seminar is for you. And then I have a variety of other situations where a couple, one, both getting old age security, couple, only one partner getting old age security, where the other partner's under 60, and then one partner getting old age pension, the other partner is 60 to 64, and getting this allowance uh, that I mentioned in the previous slide. So it's under these amounts where, that I am considering to be low income for the purpose of this talk today. Now, if you are near these amounts, the talk is also relevant. So the people who are living in that parallel universe that I talked about are the people who, in these family configurations, are receiving money that are below those amounts from all other sources other than old age security. So let me give you my top 10 countdown, my rogues gallery of bad advice to low income people planning retirement. Number 10. I don't see anybody with a drum out there that can do a drum roll. But the government will send you application forms for benefits. The answer is yes and no. Depending on who you are and what circumstances you're in, you will get an application form for benefits. But if you are applying for old age security, if you're 60, now I'm 63 right now, I'll be turning turning uh, 60, 40 year, I've been helping an awful lot of my just slightly older friends apply for old age security. And it's really interesting because um, in half of the cases, they were sent their old age form. And that's because the government knew through other sources, whether it's through taxes or whether they were receiving a program like ODSP in the province, there'll be various different institutions that will make sure you will receive an application form for benefits. But you will not necessarily get that form, so you got to make sure that once you turn 64 years and three months, so when people are singing that song to you, when I'm 64 and, and finding it funny, that's when you should start to be thinking about it. About 64 years and three months, you should be applying for your old age security. And it's, yes? I, yes, I can mention that now, that if you wait too long, um, the Canada Revenue Agency will only pay back 11 months. They, um, so you can't wait too long for your, old age, for your old age security to kick in. You can't let the timing go by. Uh, when you apply for old age security, there is a tick box and you can go fat past it really, really quickly. It says, would you like to apply for the guaranteed in income supplement? If you don't tick that box, you're not going to get a guaranteed income supplement form sent to you. And if you say, well, that's no problem, I'll just take the one that's on the web, you'll find that the one on the web does not apply for that year and you're going to have to get the new one anyways from Service Canada. So if you think you're just going to download it and fill it in and send it in, no way. What you have to do is tick that box, send in your old age security form, then they will send you the new updated form. And say for people who are going to get their old age security in July, that form isn't out yet. Even though, but the old one's on the web. So these are the tiny things you have to know. So the government will not necessarily send you. You have to be active and have to be proactive. Now, Mr. Harper has said that as part of the various reforms we're making to old age security, they're going to make some of these things automatic. They have not done so to date. Drum roll for number nine. Working age after age 65 is a good way to bring in extra money. It is up until $3,500. Now, I know some people who work in fast food who are over age 65, and once they get to about the middle of March, when they will have made $3,500 at the minimum wage, it's all free and clear. But what happens once you hit that middle of March date and you're working those 32 hours a week at minimum wage in a fast food place, for example, First of all, 
at $3,500, you must start to pay into the Canada Pension Plan. Doesn't matter if you're already retired. The rules that changed on January 1st, 2012 mean that you now have to start paying into CPP again. And it also means that even if you are receiving CPP, you still have to pay in. That's how it works now. And then also at that magic $3,500 mark, every dollar you earn will reduce your guaranteed income supplement by 50 cents on the dollar. And so already you have people who are, and of course they're already paying into the employment insurance program at about, well it's 1.88%, but that's almost 2%. So you're starting off with a tax rate of 57% on everything that you're making over $3,500 a year. So that means that a millionaire CEO walks into the fast food place and is being taxed at the highest tax rate of 46% is actually paying a, lo a, a lower marginal effective tax rate than the person who is behind the, the counter. Now the only person I've heard talking about that is a guy in the States named Warren Buffett who talks about how his secretary's tax rate is actually higher than his. He's talking about roughly the same thing would have a real parallel in Canada. Now if that same person, for example, was receiving the working income tax benefit, somebody who's working 32 hours a week full time, they're already having their working income tax benefit reduced at 15 cents on the dollar, and if they're in housing, some sort of subsidized housing, it's another 15%. I've ascertained that a person who is working the normal type hours that you would work in fast food would be paying a marginal effect of tax rate of, if they were living in housing, of 83%, which means that of every dollar, you're only taking home 17 cents on the dollar. So working after age 65 is a good way to bring in extra money up to 3,500 bucks. After that, it starts to get really dicey. And if you're working full time at minimum wage, and especially when I go outside of Toronto, I see people who I know are a little older than me in, the, uh, in these fast food places. And I keep thinking, well, they, they, must, they must know that they're hardly taking home any money. And, and so, that's a, so that's a real difficulty in our system, especially as more seniors work. Another thing you're told, and a bank will actually warn you about this, do not buy an RRSP after 65. But if you, if you take out an RRSP, in other words, if you register for one after your 65th birthday and you're eligible for GIS, one of the things that will happen is you'll be able to deduct the amount of the RRSP and the next thing you know, you're getting a higher GIS. So every dollar that you put into an RRSP, if you're low income, you will get 50 cents more in GIS. So if you put in $1,000 into an RRSP after age 65, if you have the room, and many low income people do, they will actually increase the guaranteed income supplement that they're going to get. So it's not something that you, that you hear normally, but it is something that's true. Don't buy a TFSA un until your RRSP room is used up. Well, this is absolutely wonderful advice for someone who is, is higher income and who knows that their income is going to be lower once they retire. But for, and I'll say this again, I'll introduce it now, if you know you're a person who has lower income now, often you find that your income post-retirement is actually higher, especially true of people who are on fixed incomes or something like ODSP benefits, their income's gonna be higher. So those people should be buying into TFSAs as, uh, as Ellen has already said, and just leave your RRSP room until you turn 65. So it's that parallel universe, that opposite advice than to what you would get in the mainstream. Don't take early CPP. You're often told not to take early CPP. And for someone with higher income, perfect advice. They don't need the money. If they wait till they're 65 or even right up until they're 70, the government will pay you more money. And in fact, if once you're 70 years old, they'll pay CPP that's actually 42% higher 
than it would be at age 65. But just remember that if you are in the zone where you're eligible for a guaranteed income supplement, what will happen to you is that every cent extra that you get in CPPP will reduce your guaranteed income supplement by 50 cents on the dollar. So this same Richard Shillington that Ellen was talking about, I phoned up Richard and I said, you know, people are often told to take their um, CPP later on. And what's the point at where you'd be better off waiting to get your CPP? Actuaries will often tell you that if you live till you're 77 or 78 years old, that the amount of CPP that you're getting would actually be higher than the amount that you'd get if you'd started off at 60. In other words, you're getting a higher amount from CPP, so at a certain point, the amount that you're getting that's higher overtakes the lower amounts you would have got when you were older. Well, that's true. It's about 77 years old for someone of higher income, but for someone who is GIS eligible, you'd have, Richard did some calculations for me, and it turns out you'd have to be over 100 years old before you would start to break even on the CPP calculation, so take your CPP early. Then sometimes you're told to take early CPP, and that can sometimes be the wrong advice too, because if you're receiving income from a program like Ontario Works or Ontario Disability Support Plan, which is true of 7%, of all the people in Ontario, if they take early CPP while they're on benefits, you know what happens under ODSP, they'll deduct it dollar for dollar off your pension, so don't take early CPP. So what I'm trying to do by having don't take early CPP and take early CPP on the same slide, it all depends the situation you're in. You've got to look at your situation clo closely. One size fits no one. It's not one size fits all. Number four, don't bother applying for old age security if you're a sponsored immigrant. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard that you're not eligible for old age security if you're a sponsored immigrant. You're ineligible for the GIS if you're a sponsored income. You're still eligible for old age security. So don't lump the programs all in together. They have different rules and those different rules apply at different times. Number three, wait until you have 10 years in Canada to apply for old age security. That's a number, another one that you hear an awful lot. But you know, if a little kid asks you a question, uh, how many countries are in the world? You think to yourself, well, how many countries are there in the world? Is there 50, is there 600? Well, there's about 200 countries in the world, depending on how you count them. 56 of those countries have a reciprocal agreement with the government of Canada. And that list is the oddest list you're ever going to see. It has poor countries, it has rich countries, it has South American countries, it has European countries, and then all of those countries in those same continents you'll find are not on the list. It all depended on whether they signed a reciprocal agreement with Canada, which basically means if their nationals come here, we'll pay them an index pension, and if one of us goes over there, they'll pay us an index pension. So some, some, in some cases, it's Canada that's refused to sign with the other country, and in other cases, it's the other country that's refused to sign with Canada. But you just got to get the list of the 56 countries, and for two bucks, uh, the, I have the list in, the, in the, um, one of the brochures that I have, but you can also go online to old age security and just say eligible countries for reciprocal agreements. It's very important because you, if you're in what, from one of those 56 countries, and I'm not going to sit and, and tell you what they all are, uh, if, you, if you're in one of those 56 countries, you will be able to apply for old age security when you turn 65 after one year or perhaps two years because if you come in when you're 60 then you'd be able to apply after five years because you always have to be 65 at least to get old age security so it will depend on the number of years but it's important to look at that list number two don't bother planning for retirement if you have very little money I've heard this one over and over and over again but 
You should be planning for retirement if you have very little money because it's the money that you're going to be eligible for later. The guaranteed income supplement is almost $750 a month. If you plan one way, you can do yourself out of the entire amount. $750 a month is a lot of money. You know, we're talking, what are we talking about? Between nine to $10,000 a year. And depending on how you organize your affairs, so you might not have any money in your pocket, but that doesn't mean that you don't have potential money later on. Higher than the OAS? Yeah. It is higher than the OAS. The GI, the supplement is uh, a couple, well, almost $200 higher than the old age security. And finally, buy an RRSP before age 65 for low income people. As Ellen's already said, it's just about the worst piece of advice. But you know, RRSP season is almost like Christmas. You think there's something you're supposed to go out and do. Well, at Christmas, you might, depending on your faith, you might be going out and buying Christmas presents. But RRSP season is not RRSP season for low-income people. And the chief reason is that RRSPs, when they're taken out, count against your GIS entitlement, 50 cents on the dollar. Take out $2 from an RRSP, you'll lose a dollar on your GIS. So why is mainstream financial advice wrong for low-income retirees? Well, there's three fundamental assumptions that come into play here about retirement planning and financial advice that, that actually do not apply to low-income retirees. The first is that our post-retirement income will be less than our pre-retirement income. That's considered an article of faith by all the, most of the media writers and most uh, in the banks and, it's, uh, and most people who are writing about this trying to give financial advice. Yeah, you're going to make more money while you're working and then in your retirement years you're going to make less. But for many people, the opposite is true. And why is that the case? Is because programs like Ontario Works, programs like ODSP, programs like CPP for disability, workers' compensation payments, people on a fixed income will almost, in almost every case, get more money when they turn 65 because the old age security and the guaranteed income supplement, when you put all the different little and the big and little programs together, a senior with no other income, with no other income at all, is going to be able to get $17,000 in income per year if they have their full old age security and if, they have their, if they've lived in Canada all their life. That $17,000 is much higher than CPP for disability, much higher than workers' compensation payments, much higher than veterans allowances, much higher than ODSP. It just doesn't matter. So if your post-income retirement is higher than your, than your pre-retirement income, then it means that you're taking out an RRSP for nothing. You're going to pay more. The income de tax deduction you're going to get before is going to be less than the amount that you're going to have to pay in income tax when you cash out your RSP. The second is that our taxable income will be lower at 65. For many low-income people, this is not true. Because if you get payments from veterans, they're often not taxed. If you get it from ODSP, it's not taxed. If you get it from Ontario Works, it's not taxed. But once you turn 65, Old age security is taxable. Canada pension plan is taxable. These are all taxable forms of income. Whereas the mainstream advice was saying your taxable income is going to go down. For many people who are low income, their taxable income goes up. And there's that parallel universe again. And finally, the tax credits will help, help us realize a higher income. Often the tax credits that you get pre-retirement if you have a lower income are going to be lower when you t afterwards because tax credits are income tested and they go down. So for low income retirees, the opposite, that parallel universe applies. So second a slide that's also entitled Why is Mainstream Financial Advice Wrong for Low Income Retirees? Again, I'll, re I'll repeat that the banks and financial institutions and financial advisors who don't have any requirement to know about these entitlement programs at all, those people don't know, and when they aren't able to advise you 
of those various entitlements, they will default to the mainstream advice. And as I said before, they think that low-income people are just rich people without money. Most of us are told to buy our RSPs and wait to collect our CPP retirement benefits. The standard advice is to pay into an RSP before registering for a TFSA, and almost no one advises registering for an RSP after age 65. So in other words, two things again, is that you're in a parallel universe if you're in low income because your situation is different. It's not just that you have less income. Your situation is actually the opposite of people who have higher income. And so something like, which you'd never think of, which is to take out an RSP with your RSP room once you turn 65 is actually a good thing to do. So many low-income seniors receive higher incomes when they turn 65. This is the point I want to drive home. Old age security combined with CPP and the guaranteed income supplement is often significantly higher than the social assistance, disability benefits, and the low earnings they realize in the years leading up to 65. So the mainstream advice is thinking higher before, lower after. Your reality is lower before, higher after. Taxable before, less tax after. Low income is no tax before, taxable after. So it's a different situation. So with OAS and CPP being taxable, while so social assistance and most disability benefits have, I have found, except for the CPP, are not, and the situation results in higher taxation once they reach 65, not lower. So it's, again, it's almost as if the potential low-income retirees live in a different world where the situation is the polar opposite to what is faced by most retirees. And this means that low-income and retirees need very different advice than they get from the mainstream. Now here's the, the real question, here's the real kicker. But is this advice available? The answer is largely no. The advice, if you were to go to your bank, if you were to go to a financial advisor, they don't have to take courses in government entitlements. They, generally speaking, don't know anything about them and get very confused by them. And again, the other barrier that I pointed out earlier about the E word, GIS, is an entitlement. It's not a tax credit. If there is one thing, when I'm asked what one thing would I do to change, the system, and I try to say almost tongue in cheek, I would turn the guaranteed income supplement into a refundable tax credit, because then the banks and the financial advisors would be all over it. They'd be so, oh, this is a tax credit. Here's something you should go out and get. But the fact that it's still called an entitlement seems to create a stigma for, on it for our financial institutions. So what can be done for low-income retirees? For the low-income retiree, in practically all cases except for people who are on social assistance, there's always got to be a caveat, take CPP early retirement as soon as you can at age, at age 60. Unless you're planning to live to well into your hundreds, you're not going to ever break even on the deal. Avoid RSPs until age 65 if you got them now and you're and you're younger than 65, get rid of them. Cash them in, pay the tax, because it means that you're doing yourself out of your GIS once you turn 65. Then take that money that out of the, the, the leftover money after you've been taxed on the RSP and buy a TFSA if savings are available. Often I've found people who are afraid to cash in their RRSPs because they think they're gonna be taxed on them. Well, it's true that the government takes out a 10% withholding tax right off the top, and so you see it go right away. So if you take out 5,000, you're only going to get uh, 4,500 right there. But if you're really low income, you might be far enough down in terms of your taxable income that you actually get that money back. I've seen in a number of situations where people uh, I would tell them they're not going to get taxed at all on that, and they come back to me angrily and said, oh, I had 10% taken off its source. I say, yeah, but you're going to get that back in a few months. So if you're really low income, the, uh, you're much better off getting out of that RSP. Get out of it slowly. Don't 
create a boom year. If you've got 65,000 in RSP, don't take it all out at once and be taxed at the top rate. Take it out slowly and then put it into a TFSA. And for financial institutions, give proper information and advice. There's a number of us that have tried on a number of occasions going after the people who are teaching these courses to try to make sure that they that this is mandatory material, that they have to understand this in order to get their credentials. But right now it's a little bit like the Wild West. I know some financialists will disagree with me, but they don't have to learn about the GIS when they uh, come in, and yet it's the single most important program. Uh, it's higher than old age security, and they don't have to learn anything out about it, and they're often advising people uh, to take courses of action that'll do them out, do them out of their GIS. Uh, so training staff properly would be an important thing for financial institutions and also for financial advisors. And I'm thinking of a challenge, I guess, to the Ontario government is to advocate for, with the federal government for better information and regulation. For many of you who have gone to the Service Canada website or have gone into Service Canada, Service Canada will tell you at a certain point after you've gone through their worksheets, they'll say, now you have to make an election. An election means you have to decide to do something, and it says you'll now need to go out and get financial advice in order to make that selection, that election that you're going to make and which way you're going to go. But you can't get that advice because it's largely unavailable amongst the cadre of financial advisors. Also for the Ontario government, it could inform better low-income retirees. It's something that we've been asking for them to do. Ensure course materials with the right information is taught to frontline financial staff. I can't tell you the amount of times that I've sent somebody with a perfectly good, well-planned, this is because they're low income, with a well-planned plan, take it into the bank, what happens? It unravels. And the reason it unravels is because the bank is going to sell you what they're selling you, whatever they're selling that day, which makes high income for them. They're not thinking about what your particular situation, they won't even ask you the question whether you're GIS eligible or that you expect to be because it's not part of what they do. That's your own lookout. That's something you ought to be doing on your own and figuring that out for yourself. Um, so I think they could do that. I think there's also a role for the provincial government in regulating uh, some of the uh, courses that are, the, that, are, um, uh, that are given by private institutions of various store, sorts. Um, I know, and you know, there's pockets of good advice all over the place. York University and the Black Creek Financial, um, uh, financial Group. Um, up at Jane and Finch is doing extraordinary work in trying to uh, make sure people get the right advice. Promote good advice like mine, which is here, and you got the URL and the indication for that. So anyways, that's the introduction to this, and thank you very much for listening. John. Being a member of the mainstream media, I'm writing notes like you are, and I do plan to write something about it because I think this, this word has to get out there and people have to realize. And I certainly know from my dealings with the banks that they are very powerful communicators. So that's why the media ends up often repeating that message, and that's why we put out RSP sections every February because we get the advertising from them, and then we put out friendly information that promotes that message. And I certainly see outside the banks, there are many people who sell RSPs and who also sell loans to either buy RSPs or loans against your house to save for retirement. And they're all pushing the message that you have to save. And they're also pushing the message, which I'm sure uh, John would agree with, though he didn't mention it, is that the CPP won't be there when you retire. It helps them. It helps them say that this is the only way you're going to have any money when you retire. But the CPP, unlike uh, Social Security in the U.S., was shored up by the federal government a number of years ago. It was, you know, we pay very high rates, but it will last through the baby boom. It was uh, strengthened so that no matter what happens during the baby boom, it's not going to run out of money. We now have a separate investment board, which invests the surplus. 
So there's no danger that you're going to lose CPP. And if somebody starts telling you that, that's the way you have to save because it's not going to be there. I think that's an indication that they don't really know what they're talking about, which is what John is saying, that many people either innocently or deliberately are giving you the wrong advice if you're a low-income person. John and Ellen, thank you very much. I think we've all er learned quite a bit. Thank you. And now if I can make...